Hi boys and girls, welcome back to the channel. Good to have you along. Today I'm talking about Tech N7. Um, after six years or so on the market, it was originally released in 2015 um, for console in its uh, kind of base base game format. Um, you know, it's still a wildly popular game. Uh, it has a pretty good online following uh, to this day and some pretty um, interesting and competitive matches and tournaments uh, that, that are still going on, obviously COVID aside. Um, so I thought I would break it down, you know, go through the game piece by piece and do a bit of a retrospective review on it and uh, just talk about, you know, why that is, why it's lasted as long as it has. Um, if you're, you know, kind of shopping around for a game at the moment, uh, you may pick up a really good bargain on this game and uh, you might find something in this uh, review that uh, inspires you to pick the game up and buy it. If you're new to the Tekken franchise, you know, it could be a good fit in the door, so to speak, uh, to get going on the game. So anyway, let's climb into it. I'll break it down into a couple of different sections. So let's just cover, obviously, you know, game modes in the game. We'll talk a bit about the story, and um, we'll talk a bit about the specifics. And um, at the end, I'll give you my kind of overall verdict on what I think of the the, the entire package. Okay, so uh, once you get into the top menu. You know, you, you've got several different game modes that are on offer. This, unlike a few other fighting games in recent times, say the likes of Mortal Kombat or uh, Street Fighter or something like that, it actually doesn't have a whole heap of game modes. It's actually quite simple. So they keep it um, restricted to story mode, uh, arcade mode, and that's part of the offline set. Uh, you've also got offline versus as well, so just play versus play on local console or local PC or whatever it is. Uh, then you've got your online versus, uh, which would be just you know sort of ranked matches um, and tournament gameplay and stuff like that. You've got treasure mode, um, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later. And essentially, you know, you can obviously you've got kind of tutorial practice type stuff that you can do as well. Um, so let's climb into the story mode first. We'll talk a bit about the story and just kind of how you interact with the game as you play through it. Okay, so following the events of the previous game Tekken 6, where Azazel, which was like the boss character, um, Azazel is basically the source of Jin Kazama and uh, Kazuya Mishima's sort of devil gene, right? You may be familiar with them. They've got the sort of devil eye um, in their foreheads, uh, which kind of possesses them and gives them certain powers. Um, yeah, Azazel is basically the source of that. Um, so in Tekken 6, you destroy Azazel. Uh, but we f basically join in with Tekken 7, we find that the world is kind of still at war with two main warring factions. You've got the Mishima Zaibatsu and you've got um, G Corporation. And at the moment, the Mishima Zaibatsu is led by Nina Williams. And uh, that's basically because like Jin Kazama has basically gone missing somewhere. And then G Corporation is led by Kazuya Mishima. Uh, uh, Kazuya Mishima is um, Heihachi Mishima's son. Okay, so uh, Nina's reign of, you know, being the sort of top dog at uh, the Mishima Zaibatsu is sort of cut short because Heihachi basically returns and like basically just forces her to step aside. Uh, he basically like busts into the joint and kicks everyone's ass. And he's like, right, you're all going to follow me. And because he's a badass, they just do. <laughs> uh, and then basically at this point, we sort of get introduced to like this character that we're uh, going to follow the story through his eyes, I suppose. Uh, so you, you basically, um, it's this reporter. He's sort of like a UN reporter or something like that. You know, like a war reporter. And... Um, you know, he's been in all these different countries where, where the fight is going down between these two factions. And he returns home to find, like, his hometown or village has basically been burnt to, you know, burnt to a cinder. And uh, his family has seemingly been killed. You know, they've been caught in the crossfire and they've been killed. Which obviously gives him some motivation, some anger and rage and resentment uh, towards 
Um, particularly, particularly, it seems Heihachi Mishima, like the Mishima Zaibatsu, I think is. It's almost implied in the game that the Mishima Zaibatsu, the public opinion is not in their favour. It's more, probably a little bit more in uh, G Corporation's favour at that point, at the beginning of the story. And um, anyway, so the reporter decides to sort of go after the Zaibatsu by. Uh, you know, compiling and uh, publishing an expose on them, I guess, to show their, you know, what he presumes is their, like, underhanded dealings and things like that, I guess. Um, it's not explicitly pointed out all the time, if that makes sense. Okay, so, um, Heihachi, meanwhile, his plan is to try to expose this devil gene um, in Kazuya. So the, the the general public isn't aware of his like possession by this uh, demon spirit or, or whatever. Um, so his plan is like if he can force that out into the open, G Corporation will lose support, and then the Mishima Zaibatsu can basically dominate. Uh, that that's the idea. So in order to do this, he makes a deal with a character called uh, Claudio uh, Serratino, who's like head of this serious, mysterious, serious marksman group. Um, and the idea is he's going to enlist his help and influence to, to kind of help expose Kazuya. Um, at this point, we get some flashbacks, uh, you know, sequences that kind of uh, break down um, some of the history from between like Heihachi and Kazuya. Um, and, you, and you get these periodically through the game. So and this is the first point I wanted to touch on. So through the story, you get bits of like narration. From the reporter and where it's done in a drawn manga like literally like graphic novel type style it's not animated as such and uh you know where he's just narrating his experiences or recounting like details from his interviews and um you also get story that's told through actual like in-game cutscene type graphic scenes like fully animated uh, graphic scenes um, as you'll be able to see on screen and um, my first problem is is the, 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 the I have no problem with the style of it if that makes sense but it does affect the pacing um, and I'll, I'll touch upon that later in my summary anyway um, so yeah back in the day um, Heihachi launched a like a sort of coup d'etat against his father, Jinpachi, who's just one of the bosses from the previous games, I think Tekken 5. And um, it turns out in that same year, his wife, Kazumi, uh, died. And um, he also, it's like sort of recorded in history that he threw his son off a cliff somewhere, um, which seems pretty brutal. And this is one of, the, again, I'll touch on this point where uh, when you've got the actual full animated cutscenes kind of showing this stuff, this is where the game actually does quite well in story because uh, it's put it, you know, it's given to you in like little chunks, and um, the game's quite good at trying to see if you it can play, you know, your prejudices uh, towards Heihachi, you know, it, it, it can enlist your prejudice prejudice against Heihachi Mishima. Uh, through the course of the storytelling, you know, because you see him do these things like where he, you know, he's just kicking his son's ass when he's like a little boy, um, you know, and throwing him off a cliff. Like, I mean, that's enough for most people to hate someone, right? <laughs> or at least to form a negative opinion on them. Anyway, so you get these flashbacks. Meanwhile, um, back in the present day, uh, Jin's whereabouts are established, like the UN figure out roughly where he is, and uh, he starts trying to evade Heihachi Mishima, um, but Heihachi goes after him and they attack this compound where he's like recuperating with his um, uncle, half uncle I guess, um, and you know he, with the help of his friends he manages to sort of evade capture but basically you get the impression like Jin is like on the run, uh, Mishima can't quite lay hands on him and neither can Kazuya. Um, so Kazuya and Heihachi kind of start to duke it out in these attacks against each other. Like they, they um, Heihachi eventually like leaks the the pictures of Kazuya in his devil devil form using like his control of Mishima Zaibatsu's satellites and stuff like that. Um, and then like Kazuya shoots the satellites down with missiles, and it, it's a bit like 
Arctic measuring war and they duke it out uh, through a few of those sorts of exchanges and like a bunch of like Jack 6 robots get sent to like take out Heiachi at his dojo and he beats them but he sort of fakes his own death if that makes sense and it's sort of around this point that um, Heihachi reaches out to this reporter um, to I guess tell his side of the story uh, so the reporter gets kind of brought around to Heihachi's pad, I guess. Originally, his wife, Kazumi, although he loved her, she was originally sent by her family to kind of like assassinate him, take him out. And um, that the devil gene comes from her side of the family. And um, that he had like another like illegitimate child or whatever, Lars, I think it is, um, expressly to prove that the devil gene didn't come from him, you know, for his own knowledge I suppose and um, anyway they sort of wrap up this interview and the reporter gets kind of unceremoniously booted out to go and write his piece I guess uh, but he goes out there with obviously a very different idea of uh, who Heihachi is compared to his preconceptions of what he thought Heihachi is because Heihachi comes across as like a really stern hard man that you know beats the crap out of children, <laughs> you know, and kills his wife, you know, obviously these are not good things, but when he tells his side of the story, there's a bit more to it, um, you know, he's hard for a reason, I suppose, and he's done what he's done for, for you know, he has his reasons, and I quite like that about the, the way they've done the story mode, in that they paint um, quite a complex character, uh, you know, he's, uh, you, like I said, there's points where you're not really sure who you're supposed to be rooting for, uh, if that makes sense. And you kind of find yourself, I think by the time you get to the end, you kind of find yourself back in Heihachi, really. Uh, which is maybe a surprise for certain fans, because mostly he comes across like a bit of a tyrant. And he is a bit of a tyrant. Um, and so that's the clever part of the story. Uh, that's, the, that's the part I enjoyed personally. Um, so I do think it's worth playing for that. Anyway, after the interview, Heihachi travels to this like remote volcano location that's absolutely ludicrous because he's like standing in this like tiny little patch <laughs> um, what are you doing? surrounded by like lava and I'm sure it would kill any mortal man but anyway he's not any normal regular mortal man apparently anyway um, he and Kazuya face it down in the final encounter uh, and this final fight is one of the best things about the game it's it's thoroughly impressive very engaging it's very challenging it's not, you know, it's not easy to complete um, because that match essentially works like a survival match. You know, so you have to kind of face Kazuya on several different kind of levels, and you bring out the like. Each time you kind of get through a level, he exposes more of his like devil character. So first, like you see, like the wee eye, like just, and he gets a bit stronger, um, and. You know, he just starts using his laser and stuff like that. Then um, you knock him back again, and you know, then he goes like full devil, and his wings come out, and now he can fly and use like his full, you know, devil move set and that sort of thing. But meanwhile, your you know your life bar, is, you've just got the one life bar to deal uh, with all of his attacks throughout. And the AI is actually quite good in this. It's quite challenging. Um, don't get me wrong. Like once you get the hang of it, and you you know how to fight him. You know, it's not it's not hard to, to beat overall, but on the first play, and even a couple times thereafter, you know, it is a good challenging fight. It feels like a a proper climax in gameplay as well as story, and that's something I really liked about how they approached this uh, story mode. Anyway, long story short, Kazuya actually ends up beating uh, Heihachi and throws him in the volcano. And then we get this sort of weird thing where um, basically, yeah, through the story it's highlighted that this Claudio guy, the person that he actually tried to form the deal with or the alliance with, turns out he's Akuma. And Akuma, you know, like Akuma from Street Fighter Akuma, turns out he made a promise to Kazumi, Heihachi's wife, that if she, you know, in the eventuality of her death, that he would take out Heihachi and Kazuya to prevent this sort of massive full-scale war uh, engulfing the planet. Yeah, good job, Kazu uh, yeah, good job, Akuma. <laughs> that worked out really well. 
Uh, yeah, it seems like it's a little bit all um, too little, too late to me. But anyway, anyway, he uh, sort of jumps out and faces down with Kazuya, and we're not really shown like what the outcome of that is. Um, I think it's just dangled as a bit of a cherry of like, uh, you know, there'll be more to come, that sort of thing. And that's kind of where the story wraps. So that's the, the basic story mode. Um, and it's basically played by, you know, you'll get like a cutscene, or you'll get a bit of narration from your reporter guy. Then you'll get a bit of cutscene. And the cutscene will take your, you know, follow the characters to whatever arena that they're gonna then, you're gonna have the gameplay in. You'll do a bit of gameplay, you'll get another bit of cutscene, you'll get a bit of reporter. You can go into a new chapter, better reporter, better cutscene, a few fights, you know, back and out of cutscenes, that sort of thing. Until eventually you get to the end. And that all works very well, um, to a point. My greatest bugbear with it is this reporter guy, because he's incredibly, like, monotonal. I went to the shop, and I bought a packet of bread. But the bread was stale. You know, like, it, 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 his whole narration is that sort of style. It's meant to, I guess, be a bit like film noir, like a whodunit, almost. But I think it clashes with the cutscenes. The cutscenes are, like, really, like, action-packed and really, like, drilled up. I mean, there's a scene where, like, Heihachi is literally defending himself by kicking missiles around. You know, like the Zaibatsu factory or whatever it is. <laughs> Which is incredible incredibly ridiculous but I mean that's in keeping with the style of the game it is like completely over the top a bit tongue-in-cheek you know so it doesn't need to really obey the laws of physics in that sense um, but you go from that really like hyped up over the top dramaticism if you can call it that I think that's a word to these really long and repetitive narration sections from the reporter and it just, oh, it really like, it really slows down the, the game. Uh, but if you want to know what happens, you kind of have to, you know, indulge it. Um, so that's my, my main criticism of the story mode. So that's the main story mode. Um, you've also got like character stories and they're really just like shorts. Um, so say for example, if you choose like, I don't know, law, martial law, you know, the Bruce Lee style character. Um, yeah, it's like he wants to grow his dojo business, but there's not enough of him to go about, so he needs to hire a second hand. So he, he you know, he's like, "Come challenge me for the right to teach in one of my dojos." And um, the first person he faces that's like got the skill to to take him on turns out he thinks that the guy's a bit of a dick. So Paul jumps in to like help him out, and and then they beat him. But then he gets up again, <laughs> so they didn't beat him, so then they run away like chicken shit. Uh, and that's kind of, in, again, it, it's completely pointless and unnecessary. But there, there are some giggles to be had, like Tekken's kind of known for being, like I said, a bit tongue-in-cheek. Uh, they take the piss out of themselves and they're not taking it too seriously. Um, which makes the main story all the more surprising, because it is a proper dramatic story. Um, with some proper character weight in it, actually. You know, there's points like where, like, it's tugging on your heartstrings, like, you feel bad for Kazuya because his father beat the shit out of him when he was a little boy and, like, threw him off a cliff. Uh, but then you go straight from that to the character stories where it's just, like, completely pr uh, preposterous. But they're very short snippets, so it's just, like, uh, imagine it just almost being, like, bonus content. Uh, but there's some achievements and things like that, I think, that are kind of, like, wrapped up in completing uh, those, so, you know, so there's... I think also as well, it's a good way to like get you to try all the base characters, at least just try them, and that way you get like you know you, you can get a feel for maybe two or three characters that you'd like to start to focus on playing uh, when it comes to competitive play. Um, so it serves a purpose in that sense as well, but it's nothing to read too much into. Anyway, so let's move on. Um, We'll talk about some of the other game modes. So the you've got an arcade mode, uh, as you would presume with any good fighter. And uh, mainly it's a good place to just kind of practice and refine your skills. Um, like, for, for instance, like if you just, you know, you're learning like the basic combo structures, um, you're learning your character's actual basic moveset, the basic combos, you know, just kind of like getting that down. Um, because you don't really want to go play online if you're like, I don't really have a clue what I'm doing. 
you, know, you want to at least have some confidence with your character. I think that's its main use. Um, but if I'm honest, the arcade mode in this game, it feels like the most throwaway mode in the game. It, it, it's almost like it's completely unnecessary. And I explain why that is because you've also got the treasure mode. Imagine the treasure mode as being like a, almost like a shortened arcade mode. So you'll maybe get like a couple of regular fights. You'll get like an offline promotion. So you know, so you can rank up as a player or offline and rank up as a player online. So and the two ranks are different things. But you can go in there and play a couple of like regular fights, get a promotion opportunity. And you'll get a couple of fights where it's almost like boss style fights. Um, and all the while, each time you win a match, you unlock some treasure. And that'll be some customizable stuff for your characters. Um, so maybe new hair pieces for, say you're playing with Paul, you'll unlock some new hair pieces. You might unlock some clothes, some boots, I don't know, whatever it is. And again, they're completely... You know, whereas like say the likes of Mortal Kombat kind of takes like the aesthetics, the uniforms, and the you know the outfits and stuff, it takes that very seriously. Tekken is completely the opposite. It's like if you want a guy with like color changing hair and like uh, um, what's that guy, the pianist? Oh, I can't remember his name. You you know like you know like in I think it's like Terminator Three. <laughs> Schwarzenegger has like the star-shaped glasses that look completely ridiculous. You know, you can get stuff like that. Uh, you can get like, I don't know, different flowers to carry on like the panda's back. But I mean, the fact that you're playing a game where you can play as a panda or a, a kangaroo, like, that should be your first clue that Tekken doesn't say, take itself all that seriously when it comes to the aesthetics. You know, it likes the game to look good, but it's also, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's mostly about having fun playing each other um, anyway so you've got this treasure mode and really that's if you're gonna play offline a lot for any reason you would play the treasure mode the arcade mode just doesn't have a lot of replayability it's pretty easy to beat um, so aside from maybe like you know just to take some boxes to get an achievement towards the platinum you you're not gonna spend a lot of time there I don't think um, unless you just prefer to treasure mode but I can't see why you wouldn't Play the treasure mode and pick up the treasure while you're learning your characters. That, that's just my uh, view on it. Anyway, aside from that, you've got uh, replays and tips on the menu, which is like so you can store your, your fight replays. But you can do that on PlayStation anyway, um, you know, through the capture. But um, it's handy to kind of have it in game. And that's just so that you can kind of review your matches, kind of see where you went wrong. Um, and yeah, just work on work on your game, really, if you want to take it to the next level. Um, I, I don't see a lot of players using it at casual level, but certainly for the more competitive players, I, I think it's probably something that they do make use of. Just be aware that when you update the application, uh, you tend to lose your replay data. Um, so, data. Yeah. Um, you know, so just be aware of that. Uh, don't Don't take it out on them. It's always been the way of things. Uh, then you've got a customization menu, so this is where you go in and you actually apply the stuff that you've won through your treasure battles. And like I said, the, the worlds are oyster really. There's uh, a couple of things where you have to like look at, look for like conflicting items. So say for example, you can't really... If you change your, your character's hair and then you put a helmet on them, the two are going to conflict. And um, the game will tell you that and it will tell you which one is like basically overrides the other. Um, but aside from that, you, you know, you've got pretty uh, pretty wide scope in, in what you can do for your characters um, in terms of customizations and looks and things like that. Uh, interestingly enough though you can also unlock like hit effects and you can apply them in this menu which is quite bizarre actually um, but the hit effects are like you know like so you'll punch the guy in the face and it'll be like a swirly fireball or something like that. Um, and I think that's actually kind of a cool touch. It, it only really works for Tekken. I don't think there's many other games. Like, say, for example, in Mortal Kombat, you don't really get hit effects. Yeah, because they focused on more of, like, a realism, like a gory realism, you know, is what they're going for. Uh, so it's not necessary in that game. Uh, but it's a nice touch, I think, in Tekken. Uh, just to make it a bit more your own and maybe make your, your online presence a little bit more recognizable. So if other players run into you and they're like, 
Oh god, it's that weird, like, crazy looking dude with the, you know, his, his pole character is like completely absurd. And he always has like the green flashes when he punches. Just as an example. Um, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's pretty cool. And um, I think it's another thing that's indicative of Tekken's focus. They know their customers. They know their players. They know that they're um, primarily online players. They're competitive players. Uh, in some capacity, whether you know, it doesn't really matter the level, but they're online playing each other, mostly, um, or well, the great majority is. Anyway, okay, so uh, there's, there's a jukebox mode, which is like, yeah, I guess, place the you know, you can play your soundtracks for different levels and whatever, you know, stuff that you've collected through the game. Uh, pretty useless, if you ask me, because you're playing the game and you're listening to it all the time. I've seen that that sort of thing in other games and never go into the menu if I'm honest but it makes you feel like you're unlocking and progressing I suppose when you're doing other things gameplay wise um, and then you've got the VR mode and what's interesting is like when the game launched it was really like bold on the box like VR mode supported and in my head I was like oh that's really cool are you gonna be like standing like you know from behind your character's fists seeing the other character and you know do the moves that sort of way which could have been cool. I mean, I don't know how they would have made it work because it would have been pretty complicated. <laughs> Are you going to actually learn to do the moves? Um, probably not, you know. Uh, I mean, there's probably a way you can make that work with the, the way the controllers work. I, I don't know. But that's not what they did. It's basically, you just get a wider scope uh, panoramic view of the environment. And the HUD isn't there. You know, like the, the life bars and the time indicator and stuff like that seems to have been removed from the footage I've seen I've never played it in VR myself but I've seen some posted online footage of people playing it it looks like a bit of a waste of space to me personally I'm sure it, it's probably something that just comes down to personal preference like if you have the VR set and you play that way and you're comfortable that way and you prefer it then work away but I don't think it's a big feature I don't think it's a big selling feature not not like it was made out um, at least on the box, anyway. I don't, I don't, I don't recall reading any press where they were like, "Oh, this is going to change the world" or anything. I don't think they made those sort of claims. Anyway, um, let's just talk a bit about the gameplay. I mean, if you've played Tekken before and you're familiar with it, it's going to feel right at home straight away. Like they're they're very good at like keeping the fabric and fiber of what Tekken is, and they don't really stray too far from that. They're a bit like, I don't know. Iron Maiden or the Chili Peppers, like that could be accused of making the same record again and again and again. But the thing is, like their fans are never disappointed because they always get what they want. That's why they like that band, you know, and they go back for more. Tekken's the same. They they don't really uh, completely upend everything. So if you like think like Mortal Kombat over the years, it's it went from 2D to 3D, then it added weapons, then it added multiple styles. Um, and then it went back to 2D, it introduced, you know, there was a point where it didn't have combos, then it did have combos. You know, big changes that like fundamentally altered the, the flow and structure of the game in a lot of ways. Tekken doesn't really do that, they're, they know that they're a 3D fighter. Um, they're, it's quite grounded for the most part, you know, they try to base it on like... Uh, not necessarily real martial arts, but they try to have it grounded in, in stuff that uh, has some familiarity, I suppose, from film, from telly, from traditional martial arts to some degree. And then it's, like I said, a load of like manga style tongue in cheek is injected into that to make it really entertaining and liven it up a bit. Um, and they do that very well, and they always have. So, you know. You, you can get quite far in this game by knowing a couple of like good uh, kind of one two one two three combo sets and it can be real simple like uh, jab jab cross jab jab cross sweep trip or jab jab cross high kick instead of the sweep trip and you could have some good basic mix-ups that you could go play online with some people that are your same rank and you probably do okay if you can do that you can throw and you can counter if your character's got a counter and you understand how to you know dash in and dash out of the screen uh, because you can use because it's a 3d fighter obviously you can use the depth of the screen 
uh, not just forwards and backwards, but in and out, then, yeah, you can have a good time. You can win matches. You don't need a lot. You know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go so far as to say that a button basher can win matches. They can, probably, with so, certain characters. Um, I remember back in the day with Tekken 3, like when they launched uh, Lei Wulong as a character. Loads of people, and Eddie Gordo, like when he was first launched, like loads of people just bashed buttons and like cool stuff happened. <laughs> and they kind of set the character up to be able to do that to some degree on purpose. And it was very successful because it got a load of new players in that would maybe not have played the game before because they were like, oh, I can play this guy, you know, I can actually. And then once you once you you can win a match or two, you, you you're like, oh, I'm on board. I'll I'll spend the time and learn a bit more, you know. And Tekken does that very well. It still does that very well to this day. Um, I don't think anything's really really changed that. Um, in terms of balancing, it's probably one of the best balanced fight games that are. Uh, you know, that's currently available on the market. I think um, certainly other games where, like say for example, just recently uh, the MK11 community was throwing a bit of a hissy fit about Shiva um, because a player, uh, w there was a bit of a drama because a player went online and he named his variation like, why did you do this nether realm or something like this? <laughs> and he basically used Shiva's like, stomping teleport move and and kind of spammed the hell out of that at a very competitive level uh just to prove a point that the character you know there was a loophole um and the character was op and um netherrealm didn't like the the name <laughs> that he chose for the variation uh and apparently got banned for it so oh took that bit thick but anyway Typically Tekken 7 um, and, and most Tekken games, but particularly Tekken 7, up until very recently, it didn't really suffer from very bad balancing things. Like, So you could have, say you learned three or four characters to relative competency. There was a good chance that of the characters that you decided to learn, you had an answer to the other characters that other people had decided to learn. So you were competitive. No matter what, you, there was a good chance you, you could play at your level. So let's say you had the rank of third down online. Uh, you could play comfortably at your level against another person who was like second, third, fourth or fifth down or something like that. And and you'll have a good time. You'll win matches. Yeah. Um, you're not going to just get your ass handed to you all the time. Now, recently there's been some season pass adjustments, obviously, with the, there's been, well, four season passes up until now. I don't have them all. I think I have up to season pass two installed. Um, I think that's right. I need to check my facts on that, but... Uh, season pass three, they introduced a character called uh, Leroy Smith, who's like a Chinese uh, kung fu, like, you know, like, I don't know if he's like drunken kung fu or crane style or whatever it is but it's like a traditional kung fu type thing um he was kind of op there was some balancing issues with him that caused a bit of a an outcry um but i think it sort of mainly affected like the upper echelons of like competitive play like they rocked up a, a tournament somewhere and like the six finalists were all using the same character and everyone sort of looked at each other and went there's something not right here <laughs> Because uh, that doesn't usually happen. Usually there's a bit more of a diverse character set by the time you get to the finals. But largely speaking, the game has been very well balanced. And I think at a novice to intermediate online competitive level, I, I, it's very hard to have a bad day. At, uh, that doesn't mean you're going to win all the time. But when you lose, you, you probably feel like yeah, I, you know, that person deserved to win that match, and it was a good match, and we could probably have a rematch because we're having a good time. It's competitive. I think people get pissed off when they feel like there's no chance for them to win. There's no chance for them to get a foothold and to just get up and running and going on a game. Tekken doesn't do that. It makes you feel like, you know, you've got a chance, and as long as you keep working at it and you, you keep playing and you get more experience, you will progress and you will rank up and you will be able to take on more skilled players as you go along. Um, so it's, it really excels in that department and Tekken knows its audience. It knows that the majority of players who pick it up are picking it up because that's what they want to go do. Um, and it's very, it's exceptionally good at catering to them, in my opinion. 
Okay, so after that, um, I just want to talk a bit about the graphics. Now, the game was released way back in 2015, so by today's standards, it does look a little on the crummy side. The graphics are, are good, but it, by you know, the, it's not quite as refined. The stuff you would see today doesn't look as smooth, so it almost looks as though it's a bit noisy. Um, and the best way to describe that is like, if you've ever owned a movie on, say, Blu-ray, and you own the same movie on DVD, there's data missing on the DVD compared to the Blu-ray. So there's just more of the original data kept in the Blu-ray, which is why it looks smoother and sharper, right? And the colors look more vibrant. It's a bit like that. It looks like it's on the same generation. It is. It looks like PS4 or you know Xbox One style, you know, level graphics, but it looks like it, there's a bit of noise there. But overall, it still holds up well. Like the animation is incredibly good. The motion capture is really good. The audio quality is really well produced. The music is good. It's nice. It's pumped up. It's energetic. You know, you're playing a fighting game, and um, you know that it suits the different locations. All that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, in terms of creating the um, atmosphere of the game, it's all really good. And particularly if you're playing on like a good set of headphones, like that game really booms. Yeah. Or if you've got like a you know gaming chair with a good set of speakers in it, like it'll sound like you're in a you know like a busy arcade, uh, which is cool. I always like that about tech, and they do that really well. But yeah, the graf graphics just, there is a bit of like a crumminess to them. Um, that's evident if when you're playing the story. It's not so evident when you're playing in-game, when you're actually fighting, it's not going to bother you. But in cutscenes and stuff like that, you'll probably notice it. But I think it's okay, it's acceptable, considering how long ago the game came out. You know, it's been almost six years. Um, Service-wise, in terms of like how the servers have handled, um, I remember having a couple of frustrations on Tekken 5. And to some degree on Tekken 6 was a bit better, but it also happened like there were times where you, you would log in, there was no indication there was any problems with the servers, and man, you would struggle to find matches. There were definitely players player playing, but it, you should struggle to like find the connections and, and get matchmaking sorted and that sort of thing. And um, there's a couple of options that have been refined this time, so not only are the servers themselves better and uh, everything runs smoother, it's faster, but you can, it's very good at matchmaking you to an appropriate level um, and there's a few things that go into the criteria of that level as well but it's also very good at um, so basically you can tell it like what kind of ping quality you'll accept so I think it's ranked out of five you know like one to five or whatever and you can tell it like I won't accept a match that's below three or I won't accept a match that's below four or I'll only accept like a perfect connection um, and that's quite helpful because you don't want to go on there and muck about and, you know, get disconnected two or three times before you actually get a good match. And that was a constant problem on the previous generation. So that's been really well addressed and really well handled. Um, and then my last thing is going to be just, I'll touch a little bit on the DLC content. It's generally agreed by most people in the community that Tekken has had, and Bandai, Bandai Namco, uh, the company behind Tekken, they've generally had one of the most fair approaches to uh, purchasing uh, extra content for the game, you know, whether it be a season pass or um, in-game purchasing. And Tekken 7 doesn't really push in-game purchasing at all. Maybe that's because it is as old as it was and they never really thought to do it that way. That's entirely possible. Maybe we'll start to see that going forward. I hope not, because the games don't need them. They could do it without them. But uh, as far as the season pass is concerned, uh, if you go on the PlayStation Store and you buy Tekken 7, it's $39.99 for the base game. Um, but if you pop into like a, a Kex store, you know, Sex Store, uh, C E X, I think it's pronounced Sex Store, um, Google's. YouTube are going to hate me for that. Anyway, um, <laughs> the price is as low as like, uh, I don't know, 13 to 15 quid for the base game. Um, there is a another package, like a, 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 what's it called, rematch edition, which has got the first two season passes included with it for 59.99 on PlayStation Store. I wouldn't buy it that way. M maybe, maybe. Um, I haven't checked the prices individually for those season passes now, but I think they've been reduced. But originally, when the season passes came out, 
So, let, you know, going on original prices, you would have paid 40 quid for the game. You would have paid 20 quid for each season pass, and there's been four of them. I think it's 20 quid for each, but somebody can correct me in the comments. But generally, it's been pretty good value. There's not as much pressure for you to have to go out and purchase them, and you can go character by character, so there's good purchasing options. So maybe you see in season pass, Two, for example, you know, you're like, oh, there's two characters that I like in there, but I'm not bothered about the rest of the content. Well, that's fine. You can just go and pick up, I think it's like, I don't know, Fiverr or something like that for each character. You can just go one by one for each bit of content that you want. Um, you, you don't have to commit to an entire package. Uh, and by far and away, one of my favorite things is that there is no real, like, reason for microtransactions in the game. Uh, like I said, it's very easy to pick up a customization gear for your characters and you can keep going at that as long as you want, but you probably spend more time actually just fighting online. Um, you'll just spend a bit of time um, messing about with your character just kind of for shits and giggles. And I think that's kind of cool because you don't get really get bogged down in it too much. So I'm going to draw to the end here and uh, give you my kind of overall summary of it. I think for a game that was, like I said, put out in 2015, um, it's a fantastic. It's still a fantastic game to play. It's a, a really good community to play as well, and uh, you know I still really enjoy it online. And considering I spend most of my time playing quite a wide range of games, like I'm not a specialist in Tekken by any stretch of the imagination, I feel like I can jump into it at any time and have a good time playing it. It doesn't mean I'm going to win the first match. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I can get in and feel like, oh, that was a good match. That was a close match. And it was really enjoyable. Let's do that again. And you will get a lot of people that will be like, yeah, let, let, let's go again. Um, and uh, like I said, the story, when you play that, you know, so if you're going after the Platinum, by the way, the Platinum is easy. In Tekken games, like, if you want an easy Platinum, pick up a Tekken game. <laughs> but... It's not that it's like a walkover, but it is easy in the context of other Platinums. Um, but they're very reasonable about the achievements, so they're just like, play the story through, play a few of the character stories, try try out the systems in the game. They just encourage you, like, you know, do some treasure battle, try this system out, try that system out. Um, and basically, if you go through those things and you, and you explore the systems of the game, you will be rewarded with the Platinum. That, it's basically as simple as that. Um, and I, I kind of like that as well because it just means that um, any player can get a certain level of satisfaction that they feel like they've got their money's worth from playing the game, even if they bought it at launch. Now, viewing all of that, the quality of the audio, the it's a, it's a good, engaging story. I mean, it's a bit ludicrous at times, but you do actually feel for some characters in this, which is quite impressive. It's a bigger feat than most fighting games pull off, if I'm honest. You don't really root for the characters in Mortal Kombat. I don't really care if they live or die, you know. Um, whereas in this game, I, I, I did. I kind of felt a bit of that, you know. I kind of felt my my loyalty to either Kazuya or Hayachi being pulled in one direction or another. So the story is good. The fighting experience is good. Uh, whether it's online or offline, I think if it's online, it's it's exceptionally good. If it's offline. That's a department where maybe it's like lacking a little, but it's not really what you go to the game for. I don't think it's a massive detractor. Um, in another fighting game title, it might be more of a bigger deal, but in Tekken, it's not. Um, overall, bearing all these things in mind and the quality of the service and the balancing of the game and the fact that it's so accessible and um, you know you can kind of wander in and wander out and, and it's not going to completely destroy your experience of the game. Based on the fact that as well that you can pick it up for 15 quid for the base game now and then just add characters as when you see fit for quite a small financial outlay. I think this is fair to say currently in this current generation this may in fact be the best beat em up on the market today. That's saying a lot because I really love Mortal Kombat personally but Mortal Kombat is like it's a difficult one <laughs> to strive for perfection um but I, I rate the current iteration really highly if you saw my other review I, I, was, I was pretty favorable to it but i think tekken might be a better game overall 
because it really listens to its audience, it really plays to its strengths. And um, because it doesn't actually go out of its way to try to please everyone in every way, um, it's more focused. It's a, it's like a, tight, a more focused game. Uh, I made the comment that Mortal Kombat was a, like a bit of a fashion show. And I also didn't like the microtransaction type stuff that went on in it. Now, that being said, I will balance it out by saying that I thought Mortal Kombat was a bit stronger offline. And there is a community that does that, that doesn't really venture out online all that much. But they don't play Tekken, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm going to settle on a 9.5 out of 10. That's probably the highest rating I think I've ever given out on any of my reviews. And I think um, that's pretty good going for a game that came out in 2015. Is it still worth buying today? Yes, if you're buying it at the cheap prices, um, particularly I would say if you're in a position where you haven't got a PS5 and you don't know when you're going to get a PS5, um, or if you're you know, on Microsoft, you don't know when you're going to get a, a Series X you know, a console upgrade uh, of some kind, then yeah, I think it can still really be worth it because you can buy the base game for so cheap and just bolt on little bits as when you need. And even if you just keep it as the base game, there's still plenty to get stuck into for as low as 15 quid. And um, But if you are on the next gen consoles already, or you know when you're going to get one, and you know it's going to be soon, I've got a feeling that there'll be a new tech end out sooner rather than later, probably within 12 months, um, if I had to hazard a guess. I don't know anything about that, by the way. I haven't heard anything. But if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say within 12 months that we'll, we'll definitely hear something uh, from Namco about what their plans are. Um, and in that sense, it might be worth waiting. Uh, but you can weigh it up, you know. It's pretty cheap just to get a great game to get stuck into in the meantime while you wait. So that's it. I'm going to leave it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave us a thumbs up if you did. And I'll see you next time. Hey guys, really great to have you along today. I hope you enjoyed the content. Be sure to leave us a thumbs up and a comment if you did. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell for future content. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of our videos.